I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Comments made in open session will be recorded. Um, Selectman Furlong is participating tonight uh, via remote participation in accordance with the requirements of 940 CMR 29.10 by speakerphone, which is in front of his um, usual place that he speaks. And all votes um, that are taken during the meeting will be made uh, by roll call. And the kind of going to skip around a little bit tonight because there's uh, a couple of couple of busy schedule here tonight for my first night back. So, <laughs> um, first thing that is going to be on the agenda is um, request for appointment uh, to Commission on Disabilities, uh, Andrew Freeman on uh, 98 Sunset Way and um, wish it to be considered um, the vacancy on the Commission for the Disability um, and at the request of the Chairman uh, Tom Weinrich and there's a, uh, an email and application and his term will expire in, in 2020. So if anybody has any questions or Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to make a motion. I would move to appoint Andrew Freeman of 98 Sunset Way to the Commission on Disabilities for a term to expire 2020. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Uh, roll, call. roll call. Oh, excuse me. We have to roll call. Um, Matt, are you uh, for? Against Andrew Freeman being appointed? I'm for. Four. Four. Good. Ben? Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. And yes. And I will do that. Yes. So that will be unanimous. So you would welcome aboard Andrew Freeman, and uh, uh, great to see more people jumping in. Help out the town. Uh, next thing on the agenda would be. Uh, <coughs> To, uh, <coughs> we have a request from the uh, Heron Fisheries Commission uh, to appoint uh, Gino Bellini of 239 Oldham Street and Joshua Rosario, Rosario of 67 Grove Street. And um, one of their terms will expire on 2019 and for Mr. Gino. And um, the appointment on Joshua would be an alternate vacancy on the Heron Fisheries Commission to to expire on 2020. Mr. Chairman, I would move to appoint Gino Fellini to the vacancy on the Herring Fisheries Commission term to expire 2019 and to appoint Joshua Rosario to the alternate vacancy on the Herring Fisheries Commission term to expire 2020. Second. Okay. Um, Matt, did you hear that? Yep, heard it. And are you for or against? Four. Four. Yes. 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 And I would say yes. And um, um, both of them uh, are going to be uh, very good additions to the Heron Fisheries Commission. Um, uh, Mr. Felino has already helped. Uh, in a number of different ways um, so far um, with some of the commission members. And um, the other appointment, um, Joshua Rosario is um, 
has had uh, visions of going on the uh, uh, environmental police at some time in the future. So he would be also a um, um, a good person to be uh, on on the uh, on the fisheries. Um, the other thing I'd just like to say briefly is that we have a, a really overabundance of fish this year. Um, we're, um, um, this morning's count was um, almost 40,000 fish that came up within the last two days. And the day before that, there was um, almost 20,000. And uh, most of the streams and, and the, uh, the brooks and the uh, areas near the ladders are, are pretty loaded up with fish. And, the division feels that um, we're probably going to exceed our limit that we had from last year. So uh, it's going very good. So the um, uh, consider a draft the selectman's report on proposed contingency budget, and um, that's something that. Um, you and Mike Parker, yeah, um, you know, Mr. Buckley is in the audience here. That he and I can both explain. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll run through this when uh, town moderator shows up. Um, okay. He has arrived. He has arrived? Yeah. yeah. All right. So we'll explain uh, this report. Um, actually, it'll be self explanatory when we run through uh, how we're going to uh, work the uh, proposed uh, <coughs> contingency, the FY19 budget and the contingency budget as well. We had a conference call with town council, the moderator, Mr. Buckley, and myself on Friday. Okay. Um, so we want to put that off until um, uh, after the 7.30. Is that what the um, advisory committee is on at 7.30? And, and then uh, this will come on right after that, I would imagine. <coughs> um, we'll just finish up these other um, reviews here that they uh, <coughs> uh, vote the minutes of uh, April 2nd, uh, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board accept the minutes of the selectmen's meeting of April 2nd, 2018, as written. Second. Okay. Uh, Matthew? I vote for it. For it. Yes. 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 And I'm um, yes, so that would be um, all for. And we also have the um, uh, minutes of April 9th. Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board accept the minutes of the selectmen's meeting of April 9th, 2018, as written. Second. Okay, Matthew? I vote yes. 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 And yes. So that would be all in favor. Yes, On April 9th. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a quick comment about the minutes of April 2nd. That was the meeting where we had the Plymouth County folks come in and explain uh, the uh, investing of the town's money, and it was a very um, in-depth discussion, and I would just like to commend uh, Sabrina on how she had written that up. Thank you. Do we have any old business? <coughs> None. Town Administrator. Mr. Chairman, I'll defer mine to the end of the meeting so that we can get started with the other presentations that are coming up. Okay. So there's, um, I got a couple of different dates on the times here. So the advisory committee wants to do 7.30, so the joint meeting between um, advisory committee moderator um, and town meeting. Does that want to go next? That's correct. Okay. 
Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, and I, I don't think this will be too long. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity, um, as we always do, and I think it's very beneficial just to kind of go over procedure prior to the meeting. And as I always say prior to these meetings, that um, for those who are watching or listening at home, this is not an attempt to preordain or determine an outcome. That's always up to the meeting. Um, it's just to determine a procedure and a process so that we can come to an outcome eventually. Um, but any final vote is up to the meeting. Um, and um, But I think it's important to kind of go over the script ahead of time just to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to the procedure. Um, I, I think it's going to be a very um, interesting uh, and busy meeting. Uh, I'm hoping we can start as close to 7 as possible. So I ask those that are watching and listening at home, um, hopefully they'll all be attending the meeting to get there early so they can check in and be seated in time. Uh, as we do at every annual meeting, there's a number of kind of ceremonial things we do uh, prior to the start of the actual business. So we'd like to try to start that as close to possible, uh, to as close as 7 o'clock as possible. And um, we've got 25 articles. Um, Ten of those are one article, the CPC articles, uh, and then another five in the special. And um, uh, there obviously there's a lot of interest in the budget. And in past years, the budget has been pretty much of a slam dunk, not all that controversial this year. Um, I suspect there will be a lot more debate than there has been in previous years, so which is a good thing. Um, so I guess as we always do, I'll just go through the articles one by one and just uh, kind of outline the procedure as I see it and advise you to, do it, um, to jump in. Um, I think this is the first time we've actually done consent, so the second time maybe. Well, at any rate, um, uh, we passed a bylaw a couple of years ago that allows us to do a consent calendar, um, and that um, there are certain articles that are just routine. I've never heard debated, um, and uh, we decided to kind of group those together into one vote. Um, but again, it's up to the meeting to decide. If that someone wants to pull one of those articles out and debate it separately, they're more than welcome to do that. Um, but uh, the board, um, your board, Mr. Chairman, has put uh, four articles together um, uh, as one, and that's Article 1, which is just the here, the town reports, um, and Article, oops, uh, here. and this is all on the front of the warrant, so for people who have printed the warrant at home or take a hard copy of it, they'll see this. Um, there's actually five articles. Article 1, which is to act in the reports. Uh, Article 6, uh, which authorizes selectmen to accept federal estate grants. Article 9, which allows the board of selectmen to enter into construction agreements. Uh, Article 23 is a CPC article that is fairly routine in the sense that I think by law we have to appropriate those amounts every year from CPC. So I don't expect any debate on that. Um, and Article 26, which is the one that allowed this, the election is actually part of the warrant. So it's always on there, even though we don't technically have to vote on it. So we'll do all those together. Um, and I'm assuming the advisor will make a motion, and we'll, we'll try to dispose of those uh, at one time. So it'll save us a few minutes anyway. Um, Article 2 is the uh, wage and personnel um, classification, which is in Appendix D in the back of the warrant. And I'm assuming it's going to be moved as printed in the warrant, no changes. Um, one change. One change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and obviously, the meeting is welcome to change it if, if if they want. Someone wants to amend it, they can. That doesn't usually happen, but they can certainly do that. So as we always do, we'll do each uh, each section appointed, elected, part time, full time. We'll do those separately. Um, <clears throat> Article three is the. Um, I skipped over, over the budget, didn't I? Article 3 is actually... Three is the budget. Three, three is the budget, budget. yeah. I, I went to 4. No. I'm sorry. Yeah, 2 is the wage and personnel. Uh, 3 is the budget. Um, and we'll go by department by department, as we always do. Um, and I'm no, not sure whether advisory wants to make a presentation prior to the budget, um, or if that's yet to be determined, or... Yeah, um, prior to the meeting, prior to the budget. Uh, yeah, uh, that makes sense. So there are five um, line items that are going to be subject to a, the motion will be that the higher amount will be subject to a proposition override. And I'm assuming that has the support of the board and 
as, as well as advisory. Um, advisory will make uh, what we call a contingency motion, which is will be a higher figure, and all this is again printed in the warrant, subject to an override. So the way it would work is if, uh, and I'm kind of doing this for the benefit of people who may be watching or listening at home, um, the higher amount, uh, these amounts will all be together. Five separate questions, is that correct, on the, on the ballot on, sa on the following one Saturday? One question. Five items, one question. Five item, one question. So just one question. So it's all or nothing? Okay, so, so um, the motion by advisory will be the higher amount subject to the override. If the override passes, uh, then the higher amount passes. If it doesn't, then the lower amount passes. Um, if that motion by advisory, which is the contingency, put the additional amount, the higher amount, subject to proposition two and a half override, fails, then advisory will move the lower figure. Now, the thing that I want to <coughs> mention, and again, I think you'll explain this more in the next in the, in the presentation, but the thing that I want everyone to be clear about is that the, the, I know there's been a lot of thought gone into these figures and the uh, suggestion of, a, of an override, but all of this is up to the meeting. The figures, the motion, how much goes is subject to an override, how much isn't, is all subject to a meeting, uh, is, up, is subject to the, to the meeting itself to decide. So any of these are amendable within reason, and I want to make sure people know that because I, I think it's important. They can amend it. Uh, within reason, there are consequences, both financial consequences and procedural consequences uh, to amending these motions, but they can be done. And as you mentioned, Ed, um, we had a meeting, conference call Friday to discuss procedure, and a lot of that discussion was about what if there are amendments on the floor, because it's up to the town meeting to decide. So um, those five line items are the line items that are in the police budget, the fire budget, and the DPW budget, right? Um, so, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, advisory will make the motion. They'll make if the the first motion fails, they'll make a second motion. But any of those motions is subject to amendment uh, from the floor. So. Um, so that's the budget. Um, Article 4 is um, to raise and appropriate um, money to establish the Water Enterprise Fund and to operate the Water Enterprise Fund. Uh, that's uh, pursuant to Appendix B, which is in the back of the warrant. That's usually fairly routine. Article 5 is uh, the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, establishing and appropriating from that. That's Appendix C. Uh, Article 6 is, um, I realize if you don't have the warrant in front of you, this may be a little difficult to follow, but Article 6 is one of the ones that we, um, the routine articles in the consent calendar. Um, Article 7 is to establish in perpetuity, right, um, the revolving funds, there's about a dozen or so of them, and as my understanding is we can do this once and then we don't have to do this again. This portion of it, right? This portion of the town by a lot. Yeah, because every year there's an article in the budget that establishes all these, and we do it every year. So these would be established in perpetuity, uh, and then we wouldn't have to do this again. <laughs> Tell me. So. Just, just set the limits. Set the limits, right, yeah. yeah. So um, so that's Article 7. Advisory, we'll move that, right? I'm assuming all these advisory will move up to this point. Um, article 8 um, sets up. Uh, a revolving fund, uh, 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 more revolving funds, right? Funds. Oh, this ends up the funding, I'm sorry. This is the funding for the revolving funds that we theoretically set up in the first uh, Article 7. Okay. So we may want to think about postponing Article 8 that comes up before Article 7. Okay. Uh, nine, nine we, would, we would have done as part of 7 and 8. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, <coughs> Article 10, maybe, uh, Ed, if you could explain this a little bit, um, there may be some questions about this. Um, <coughs> it's an article submitted by the Board of Selectmen that sets up a payment in lieu of taxes program for a certain parcel. Yeah, um, it appears that um, the uh, Brigham and Women's Physician Organization is going to buy 
four acres of land at Corporate Park, and they're going to build a 30,000 square foot building. Um, some are, uh, part of it is going to be taxable, uh, some may not. So that's going to be uh, um, uh, um, determined by the Board of Assessors. And if that is the case where uh, a bulk of the uh, property isn't taxable, then the selectmen then would be authorized to enter into a pilot or a payment in lieu of taxes agreement. I think uh, Brigham and Women's is proposing to call it a community services agreement, and that's to be negotiated, you know, with the chief assessor and myself and the board of selectmen. But this authorizes the selectmen if they need to and to enter into a payment in lieu of taxes. But that's first going to be determined by the board of assessors about whether. The, that all the property or part of the property is tax exempt. Um, and everyone's moving favorable action, right? Both for yes. selectmen and yes. advisory. Uh, who would be the appropriate one to make the motion? Does the board want to make the initial motion or an advisory? Well, I can't. No. <laughs> we can do it. Sure, we speak on it. Well, the selectmen can make it. For continuity, for continuity, it might be best if the advisory committee. Yeah. Uh, take it. Okay. And, yeah. and anything that on the floor, anything all. that you, you folks don't feel comfortable with, we will we will take. Yep. Okay. Um, Article 11 is um, allowing us to forego some small amounts of personal property taxes, adopting this section of the Mass General Laws. Um, everyone's in favor of that advisory. Yes. Uh, move that one. Okay. Um, Article 12. Um, Submitted by advisory, and um, <laughs> you'll move that. And it just makes it easier to get a quorum and operate, essentially, right? Yes. Um, paraphrasing, over paraphrasing, oversimplifying, I should say. But okay, Article 13, um, routine article, five thousand dollars for Assessor Community Action Council advisory. We'll move that. Um, article 14, uh, authorizing the Recreation Department to hire a part-time senior clerk. Advisory is recommending More against it. Yeah, so uh, recreation will have put that on the floor. Okay. Um, Article 15 um, is um, an increase in the general reference librarian position, or or just to fund it. I'm sorry. That would increase the uh, the number of hours that that person works. Oh, that's right. Okay. All right. So it's amending the wage and personnel. Classification scale, which we really voted on already. Um, is advisory? Okay, Deborah. Is advisory taking a position on that yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, and Article 16, okay. So Article 16 and 17 are kind of a, a to a certain extent, um, a redo of the budget items. Um, 16 is the uh, fire department's. Uh, positions, two positions, um, and 17 is the two positions for the police uh, department. Now, my understanding is, and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> if the contingency article passes, um, mm -hmm. then we just need to act on these articles to establish the positions. That's right. Okay. If it, they do not pass, then it's fair game. So I don't know what the chiefs want to do if they, I mean, it's an open book, essentially. You can start the debate over again. You can, I mean, it's, so those, those are the options. Um, and we can, it's a separate article, so we can re-debate the whole issue again, if you want. I mean, going to town council, there's nothing that says we can't do that. So it's your call if you want to move it or whatever. Um, for Article 18, which is uh, to fund police cruises, and Article 19, which is to fund a pavement program for the DPW, those, are, those items are also one of the ones that we will have voted on that is contingent upon the two and a half override. And if the contingency passes, then there is no need for Article 18 or 19. If it does not pass, then we can take it up again, right? Sure. And it's up to the DPW and uh, again, Chief Wall, whether you want to take it up again, but 
Um, <clears throat> so Article 20 is appropriating money for Ludham's Ford, improvements to Ludham's Ford uh, Dam. And has the advisory taken a position yet? We're going to work with DPW first. Okay, so give that up to DPW. And it is a borrowing authorization, so it would require a two thirds vote. Article 21 is to establish a town manager form of government. And um, this has been submitted by the town government study committee. So I'm not sure whether the board, who wants to make the motion to put it on the table, would that be, is it Tim Brennan from the? Okay, all right, we'll touch bases with him. Um, and his advisory made a recommendation, which is favorable. favorable. Okay. I, I could speak to that, the Tim oh, Brennan. That's right, you're on. I'm on I am You're on, on it, yeah, I'm right. sorry. Tim is chairman, we'll make the motion. Okay, all right. Um, Article 22 is, um, to create a capital projects fund stabilization, uh, a capital project stabilization fund advisory favorable move favorable action, and uh, that requires a two-thirds vote as well. Article 23, uh, we will have disposed of um, in as the part of the consent article. Article 24 are the ten different recommendations from CPC. Um, I won't go through each and every one of them, but is there any that Advisory does not recommend favorable we action. Okay, all right. Um, board support all the items? We do. Yeah, okay. um, and then Article 25 is um, a petition article by Bob DeMarzo. Um, making some changes to the right to farm. Um, and do you want to move that? Since it's a petition. So, um, advisory, that they can take a position. Is the board taking a position? Okay. All right. Uh, and the last one is the, um, again, the warrant. Um, so that's the annual. <coughs> Did I miss anything? Okay. Uh, in the special, there's five articles. Um, article one, um, and again, this is moving existing funds. Um, we're not raising, appropriating any money from tax levy. All that money's already been raised for these special articles. Um, article one just uh, funds a number of different um, departments and advisories would move that one. Article two is to pay an unpaid bill advisory. Move that one, it requires a nine tenths. Article three is to repair storm damage to town buildings. That's borrowing. T uh, is advisor taking that position? Okay. So who's going to move that one then? Favorable action? Okay. Uh, that requires a two thirds. Um, Article 4, DPW dump truck plow sander um, from water surplus. Advisory committee is recommended favorable action. You move that one. And Article 5 is new water main um, on Montclair Avenue to be funded from water surplus. And you folks will move that one. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Once again, I just urge everyone to get there early and um, to get there. <laughs> it's an important town meeting, and um, uh, we need everyone's attendance. So we can dispose of it in one evening. So thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming and explaining that. Um, almost 7.30 is the um, advisory committee finance presentation ready to go forward. Good evening. Uh, my name is Linda Peterson and I'm chairman of the uh, advisory committee. And I'd like to welcome everybody that's here and on TV to the second annual uh, advisory committee, specifically to discuss the financial state of the town of Pembroke as to how we got where we are and uh, why. And we thought it was a good time to have this just before town meeting, which I like to remind people is next Tuesday, 
at the town hall, at the high school, at 7 o'clock. And we're hoping that uh, all the registered voters in town will attend. We picked this particular time and, and location because we knew that it would be part of the Board of Selectmen meeting and also some of the town officers would be here so that any uh, questions either that have been raised through something that, that the moderator said or something that may come up with what we're discussing. It. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Curley, who's the Vice Chair of the Advisory Committee for our presentation. And then we'll follow it up with any questions, concerns, comments. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we did this last year. It was very, very positively uh, received, so we are uh, repeating it. And it may become an annual if people really like it. Um, it's, it gives us a little more in-depth, and, and it provides people with a better uh, chance to um, ask questions, uh, because when you get to town meeting, you sort of feel like you want to get the business taken care of, and you don't want to necessarily uh, uh, spend the time asking questions. So anyway, I'll, I'll get right down to it here. I want to uh, just go over a few things here. I, I do want to point out, you can see here that the uh, general government as a percentage of the budget went from 3.39 to 3.22. Uh, people always say, you know, if you're going to reduce something, why don't you cut the general government or whatever. Uh, in general, as you can see, it's, it's really been bare bones. We're down to uh, practically nothing here, and it's, it's really pretty well the smallest. Uh, part of the um, uh, budget overall. Public safety, as you can see, has gone from 11.11 to 12.29 over the past 10 years. Uh, it, the town has made a commitment to that, and uh, it, it shows in the funding. Um, and it, it's been increased at an average of about 5.5% a year. Uh, the schools have dropped down to 53.9% of the budget, and that's something that I will go into a little more detail as we go through the presentation. The other major factor, of course, is benefits and insurance. It's something we've been discussing for years, but you can see that that's been going up at 7.2% a year. It's gone from 18 to 22% of the budget. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, really one of the significant factors and it's something we have virtually no control over. On the revenue side, um, I really want to start out with the uh, second line, the state aid. Uh, the state aid uh, actually has dropped from 32.88 to 25.21 percent of our budget. <coughs> it's going up as, as over the last 10 years, only 5 percent in the 10 years. That's 0 0.5 percent a year in the uh, increase in that. What happened there was a few years back uh, they redid the lottery A formula and we had a significant drop. At this point in time we're still $354,000 a year less in uh, lottery A than we were 10 years ago. So that's, that's had a significant impact in um, what we've been able to do. It's, it's when you really think of it um, even if taxes are going up and, you know, whatever else we can raise, to have something that was a third of the budget go down to a quarter in revenue is, is a significant drop. That's, that's made things quite a bit difficult over the past 10 years. So, you know, obviously what's happened here is that property taxes have been going up uh, as a percentage of the uh, revenue from 59 to 64 percent. And then, you know, you have other available funds, uh, which uh, it's, uh, you know, that's uh, free cash has increased, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little while. School construction funds, school athletic funds, the COA transportation, indirect water funds, those are some of the major aspects of that. And then, uh, of course, local receipts, I'll get into that in a few minutes. I did want to point out that the state aid by town, if you take a look at that, um, we're, we're actually not in too bad a shape relative to most of the towns around here. It's not as easy to compare. Halifax, Plimpton, Kingston, Hanson, and Whitman are all part of um, regional school systems. And the school aid, the Chapter 70 money, bypasses the town and goes direct to the uh, um, regional school district. So you can see why some of those have 
uh, very low, like Hanson, $129 state revenue per capita. Um, the other thing is, is I, I threw Brockton in there as a comparison. Um, they sort of make everything else pale. <laughs> you know, they, they, they take up quite a bit of money there. The excise taxes is one of the major uh, factors in terms of uh, free cash that we've had and, and, and such. And you can see that there was a period uh, in 2009, 10, 11, even into 12, that it was, um, it was really a flat uh, or down uh, item. And that was, of course, right after 2008. And finally, uh, as you get into 2013 and 14, people started buying cars again. Is really the uh, the main part of that. Uh, but it is a major factor to consider. Um, then the total local receipts. Uh, again, it's it, it went through that phase primarily because of the uh, the excise tax. And that brings us to what happens with the free cash and the uh, snow and ice deficit. Uh, historically, over the past uh, eight, nine years, um, it's, it's been fairly close. You see in 2011, uh, the, the, the difference between the uh, free cash and the snow and ice was only $223,000. Um, and in 2015, we had a bad winter, and you can see that the snow and ice deficit topped over a million dollars. Uh, it's uh, obviously an extreme number, but it's it's something that you have to be uh, aware it, it's possible. And hopefully we don't get another 10 feet of snow anytime soon, uh, except my wife's hoping for it. <laughs> uh, the other part of it is, is you can see that the free cash, um, you know, it's it's been bouncing up and down, a little bit down in the last year and uh, such. And one of the things that we have here is that um, the local receipts that we did in the budget um, in 2017 uh, to 2018, uh, we, we added the solar and uh, things to the uh, uh, budget for revenue, but we increased the uh, budget for the local receipts by about $785,000. And uh, in reality, that 785000 was free cash in 2017. That's not going to be there in the future. And that's, that's a significant uh, sum, especially when you consider that the uh, um, free cash at the end of the town meeting is projected to be about $70,000. And the current snow and ice deficit is already 451000 so those, those are pretty significant uh, factors. Uh, and the other part of it is the use of free cash to balance the budget. Over the past few years, you can see that we went up to 600000 in this past year. Um, and that's really going to be difficult to uh, maintain. Uh, again, it's the, uh, the, the Snow and ice deficit over the past few years has been uh, 685, a million one, and 637. 2017 was down to 523. So you've got to count on 600 to 700,000, really, on an average for the deficit over the past few years. And the free cash is uh, <coughs> um, is going to be squeezed in the next couple of years. One of the other ways that we did it's I, I did a comparison of 24 towns in the area, and um, took a look at uh, what we pay in terms of a percentage of budget, where we are in it. You can see that the police and uh, fire, the police is just a little bit over, and the fire department is almost right on the average and the median. So about half the towns uh, spend less than us, and about half more in the police and fire. So. You know, it is something that we have, uh, you know, increased significantly over the past few years. Um, in, the, uh, in the bottom one, it's the uh, per capita. Uh, the police at 191 is a little bit below the average, and of 197. So it's, it, but it's close per capita. Uh, fire 169 versus 179 average. Again, again, it's fairly close, and we're not too far off from the median. 
The education, we're, we spent 53% uh, in 2016. Uh, that's, I meant to mention, this is 2016, <coughs> which is the latest I could get the uh, comparisons through the state website um, on these. Uh, the average was 49% and the median 49%. So the schools that were actually uh, doing a little bit better, uh, spending a little more, even though it's come down as a percentage of the uh, town budget. Uh, in 2016, per capita, we spent $1,615 in education versus an average of 1585 or a median of 1557 So it's it's really, um, you know, we, are, we have had a lot of uh, money go in there. And a part of that, of course, is we did have the override of $1.3 a couple years ago, which pushed that up. Uh, public works, uh, I know the DPW commission is going to uh, love to see this, we're way below other towns in, in percentage and in dollars and what we're spending in public works. Uh, 3.37 to a median of 4.87, uh, $102 versus a median of 143 per capita. So that's that is, uh, I, I guess, that if they say that we've they, uh, we haven't uh, treated them as fairly as they they want, I think that they have some justification. Um, fixed cost uh, were higher than it, and that part of that is that. Uh, probably about uh, two thirds of the towns in this region pay the 75 percent of the health care, and, and the other third are at 50 percent. So it's um, you know it, it, it's it, we're at the 75, so we're uh, ahead of the average and above median on it. But uh, that's because of the uh, the health care costs. And I know a lot of people, they, they look at the budget in and of itself and they say, you know, well, look at the debt service, it's a killer. Uh, but the debt service is actually less than um, the average and less than the median. And last week, uh, the uh, presentation that was made by the professor from UMass uh, also noted that our debt service was lower than, uh, than what they actually recommend and, and so forth, and that it's that is well below. The other thing I want to say is, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they say, oh, we're high, high tax town, we're high this, we're high that. Our actual total expenditures in Pembroke per capita is 3047 The median is 3056 That means that there's more than half the towns spend more than we do. And the average is 3197 so some spend quite a bit more. So we actually are in the lower half of spending in a town. So that's, you know, when you when you're really looking at that, that's a that's a um, a, a major item. Uh, when when people they you know when they see the tax bill, they always think that's a you know it's crazy. Where's all this money going? But uh, we're actually spending less than most and such. The, uh, and the bottom of this didn't quite come through. <laughs> um, the uh, school enrollment is an issue, and when I mentioned before that the school, as a percentage of the um, budget, has been coming down, uh, you can look at the enrollment over the last 10 years, from 2008 to 2017. Uh, what's on the bottom, it's not quite shown on that slide, is the percentages uh, and the, uh, the total. Since 2008, the total enrollment is down 603 which is a 17.61 percent drop, but the K through six is down 522. That's almost all of it, and that's a 27.03 percent drop in the K through six enrollment. Whereas the middle school and high school is down 81 through this period, which is only 5.43 percent. And uh, but of course, what's happening, and uh, you can see uh, as the Enrollment went down in the uh, elementary school level. It, it fed into the high school, and that actually increased for a few years. But in from you know 2016 and 17, you see the two two lines have uh, combined. They're both dropping, and it's it's essentially as the as the uh, elementary level gets into the high school, it starts to uh, force that down. The total enrollment. Uh, has gone down from, uh, you know, it, it's it's a large drop, and this 
feeds into the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the percentage of the school budget to the town has gone down. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a big part of why. Uh, the obvious thing is, is as the number of pupils goes down, the state aid goes down, because that is based on number of pupils. And um, obviously when you have, a, you know, a 25% drop, uh, you know, it's, you, you read a few things, some people complaining about some teachers being let go in an elementary level, I think it was six this year. Uh, and it's it's one of these things that the trend is going to really have to continue and it's just based on numbers and uh, Over the next few years. This is going to work its way through the junior high and the high school and um, You know, it's it's just something that's uh, you know, we all know that uh, Hanson for instance, they're, they're combining both their elementary schools into one for the same reason It's the significant drop in enrollment in the area so um, you know in the future, the uh, the amount that we're, we're putting into the schools as a percentage is going to be dropping continuously, simply based on numbers. It's not that we're anti-education, it's just we don't have the students there anymore. Um, another thing I just want to point out, uh, you can see Pembroke's uh, stabilization. It's uh, better than uh, a number of places, but there's a lot of them that have a lot more in there. You know, Plymouth is uh, obviously a much bigger town uh, and so forth, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of them have more money uh, in their savings than what we do. Um, and, and that is a little bit of a concern overall. And uh, on, a, on a more positive note, the unemployment figure in uh, uh, Pembroke uh, over the past few years has actually declined quite a bit. It's, it's good to see that uh, you know, we have a lot of people working, uh, although hopefully they're all in uh, full em full employment as opposed to just the uh, small stuff. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, a quick overview of where we are, and um, we're open to questions and uh, anything in more detail that you want. And it's, it's up to the <coughs> up to you now. Um, can you just go back to the enrollment slide? I, I do think we need to verify a couple of things. Um, when you're right, enrollments have dropped. They have not dropped down to 2,800 and change students. Um, it's far closer to um, at about 30 million. Mm -hmm. I believe it's about 2,300. We hover closer around anywhere between 29 and 3,000. Okay. Um, well, I, I took this straight out of the uh, right, right. So we'll time report. Right, so we started changing the kids' health. Please don't Thank you. Um, right, you know, Steve is right that in, in the case of enrollment, enrollments have gone down. It is important, though, when we're thinking out, right, because one of the things we got to get better about, and I think um, even the team have been really good about this, is not thinking about just this year, but the next four or five years down the, the road. Um, our enrollments and our kindergarten enrollments have started to stabilize a bit. So we can't just assume that we're going to have this continuous downward trend, but I have the graph. Um, the graph is, is basically portraying it, number one. Um, I also think from a funding perspective, funding for the schools is mainly around personnel and staffing. Right? So while we were able to cut six six positions um, this year, mainly because of enrollment driven reductions. It doesn't mean that if you lose 20 kids, you can lose a teacher. Or if you lose 30 kids, you can lose a teacher. It's just, you know, because unfortunately those 20 and 30 kids are sprinkled throughout 12 grades and multiple, you know, multiple grades. Well, you, have, you also have three schools that go in there. That's right. You know, and then we we that discussed that at that meeting. It's yep. So <laughs> it might only be a few in the first grade and, you know, five in each. Correct. What do you do? That's but, right. Um, as you know, if if the trend were to continue, and I, I did try and through uh, various places, I tried to get uh, birth rates, uh, but there was nothing from. Uh, I mean, it was only like seven or eight years old, so I couldn't get anything that that would be more current that might uh, shed more light into it. I don't know if you have those available, and you know, it'd be interesting to see. 
because that's what will feed into the kindergarten in a few years. Um, and I'm happy to like the superintendent talk to it. We did do a refresh on the enrollment study. We do it every couple of years as part of our own fiscal planning and our own due diligence, um, which is why I'm just cautioning folks because I don't want you to think that you know, we're going to all of a sudden go from 2,800, is this is projected, and if we're really around 3,000, so the curve is nowhere near that steep, but 3,000 down all of a sudden 2,700 in a couple of years, mm -hmm. and that will result in 15% savings on $34 million. Because reality is it's just economically, realistically, and how the, the staffing and the budgeting and the dollars work, it's just that doesn't work. The other thing, too, that we all need to be very cognizant of, well, Whitman Hanson did do a combination on schools and in uh, physical bricks and mortar. Pembroke has an issue with our three elementary schools where we built two elementary schools that can ho house over 900 kids and one small school, meaning Hubbellock, um, that houses about 550. Uh, as a result of that, it's very difficult to combine schools, right? Um, we've even gone so far as to look at <coughs> could the junior high school be put into Havama? Could you then turn around and sell the junior high school in order to generate capital? Unfortunately, the economic build out and the money that you'd have to put in to make that happen would be very difficult. So the one school that you may be able to, that you would potentially be able to give up would be Havama, which is right across from the high school, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense just from where it's located. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that. That's all. And I didn't see it, but it would be interesting to see and maybe... Oh, please identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this lady needs <laughs> 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 Yes, my name is Libby Bates, 116 Washington. Uh, I just had a question, and maybe it's a question Patrick can answer, but do you have any data showing the trending for cost for a student uh, and that would be interesting because I know for many, many years, Pembroke was always marginally on the low side. And it, it, with the increasing enrollment and the budgetary situation, is that number going to go up? such, in, and it depends on whether they get another job and, and such. Um, 
I know that in uh, 2003 when we had the $2,357,000 cut to state aid, <laughs> that's been burning in my head. <laughs> um, we had a lot of layoffs in the schools and police, fire, DPW. I mean, there was a lot of cutbacks all over the town. And the uh, unemployment came in uh, really within a few months, about, about probably about half of them had found jobs elsewhere. And whether it's in a town or not, I, you know, but so the, uh, the unemployment wasn't so bad uh, as we feared at the time when we were budgeting for it. But that's, that just depends. I mean, if, if all of the area, if you lay off the teacher and all of the schools in the area are facing the same thing, that teacher's not going to be able to find a job in the area. You know, it's, it's uh, so it, you really can't say one way or the other. A couple other things. Um, it's been a valuable tool, and I want to commend everybody for what you've done. Uh, snow and ice, when you start doing your projections, mm -hmm. are you using last year's number, some kind of average, or just wishing and praying? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, a, as you know, one of the things with the snow and ice is um, it's, it's an area that can, um, during, the, during the year, they can overspend at will. A, a, basically, when they need it, they can spend it. Uh, it is really the only thing that I can think of in the budget that you can overspend without going to the town meeting, et cetera. So traditionally, and, and we're not the only town, we've, we've underfunded it. And, and um, you know, I know that the town accountant has made a recommendation, and I know that the if, uh, professor that came in last week made a similar recommendation, if you look at his information, of increasing that, like, 25000 a year in the budget and start getting them more realistic. Um, trying to see where that was in the, uh, you know, you can see here we've, we've had some, um, You know, over the past few years, it's it's been a significant number, and as I mentioned before, it's uh, well over. <coughs> what it is now it was four hundred fifty-seven. Was it four hundred fifty-one thousand as of uh, as of right now? And uh, what's knock on wood that we don't get any more <laughs> at this point in time? I'm ready for spring, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's 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 a significant figure uh, um, as to what. Well, by the way, that's total spending there, not not the deficit. It's it's uh, the 523 is total. So this year is actually slightly up from last year in terms of our total expenditures. Um, and this is a comparison of uh, cost per mile to a number of towns uh, that was started uh, back in 2014. I've been keeping it going and. and Keeping that statistic. question. So, um, July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2019, you know what you're looking at with the budget. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the following year and given any projections? Um, well, the, the interesting thing is, it's, you know, we've, we haven't done a real in depth ourselves into that, uh, but, um, Professor Cirillo came in from UMass, and he gave a nice uh, <coughs> presentation last week. I hope everyone got a chance to see it. And he was projecting how five years as to what's going to happen. And he gave some guidelines on that and what we can do and what some recommendations are. Um, obviously, you know, he was showing like a million dollar deficit for next year, but that's increasing a lot of other things in terms of, um, you know, fixed assets and things like that that you have a decision to make on it rather than just spend it and try to get it into shape. But he gave a nice, uh, he, he developed a nice tool that can now be used, it can be updated every year, and we're not going to be able to get an idea of what we're doing, where we're going, where we have to look at, and what we have to um, uh, do in the future, whether we have to start to, to look <coughs> at um, whether we're going to need cutbacks because we just can't get this or that. Um, if we uh, find other sources of revenue and how we uh, approach it. He, he also makes sure that the plan includes the funding for the OPEB uh, and includes funding for you know, several other things like that. Um, so it was, it was very, very good, very uh, thorough. And you know, I 
I really enjoyed listening to it last week, but I'm a numbers geek. <laughs> Some people may not have had as much fun. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? itself, um, if the overrides go through, the budget will be sixty-three million one hundred seventy-nine thousand four hundred and sixty. But that's mm -hmm. we don't have that situation. Well, that would be with the if override the going through. through. If the override does not go through, the budget is sixty-two million four hundred seventy-one thousand four hundred sixty dollars. Where would that be? Was money was within the budget or? That that is, um, we're using about six hundred thousand dollars in one-time money for that. There's a, a Civil Lake withdrawal fund that we uh, used about ninety-eight thousand of that and five hundred thousand of free cash. Uh, as of this point, if everything goes through like this, we'll have seventy thousand dollars in free cash and ninety-four thousand left in that Civil Lake withdrawal fund, and and that's essentially our savings coming out of this town meeting. Uh, it's not much. <laughs> not at all. It, it can seriously affect the bond rate. So, the question is, why did you say, why did you go there? One of the things we've done in the past few years is, um, in, in some of this, in some discussions with Ed and Mike, um, We've yelled at them for using it, et cetera, and so forth, seeing what we can do to, to, to influence it. But we, we have made a concerted effort, uh, especially with the budget, to go in with a unified figure. Um, it's, it was, what, about seven years ago we went in with a double figure, and it was, you know, it, it was confusing. Uh, it, you know, it, it was a nightmare in town meeting when we did it. No one knew what was going on and we just ended up voting the higher figure anyway. But it was a very confusing meeting and it was one that, um, you know, uh, there was one time they, they, there was a uh, proposal to use some uh, stabilization to balance the budget and we flat out, you know, dragged our feet and, and that was withdrawn. Um, so we've, we've made it known and again, I'm I'm letting everyone know uh, the use of free cash is uh, it, it's pretty well the worst thing you can possibly do to balance a budget. It is, uh, as I said, we've got 600000 in uh, uh, one-time money out there and at this point in time we've got about, um, about 160000 in savings going into next year. And as I mentioned earlier, we had about $800,000 that we increased budgets that are going to negatively impact free cash this year. Um, I'm not going to project what the free cash is uh, per se, but um, the last study heard was, you know, that excise tax was coming in about the same as last year, and that's one of the major factors. So I'm looking for a serious drop in free cash this year. How much, I don't know. And one more question. Very involved in the law. We always used to say that you know this, this would be an override. And I don't see anywhere in here that tells anybody that there's an override. And you know, I know you have it broken down, broken down to three different things. Now, if I'm kind of confused, if one of these passes uh, at town meeting was uh, for the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one's still, um, then, then what? Then, then you have something on the ballot that doesn't coincide with, with yeah. what 
the vote is closed okay. for our town meeting? Well, well, first of all, the, the, the best way to look at it is um, if you look, if you have the warrant and you look at the budget, you see that there's the town administrator and then contingent. The contingent has those higher numbers in there. That is the one that's contingent on the overrun, those, those specific, specific numbers. Legally, um, if the override passes at the ballot, then we are authorized to spend that money. If it does not pass in the town meeting, that money is still authorized for a year. I think it, it's something we can come back in the fall and take it up again. I think is it, I, is that correct? And I think Mike will let the answer that. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. So you you've got the ballot question is an authorization to raise taxes, and, and that is a separate function from the actual spending of them. Um, and I, I would caution that once that's authorized, the contingent budget, if it, if it does not pass, um, at, at the fall town meeting, I believe we could spend on something different, can't we? Well, you could, town meeting could, uh, mm -hmm. or else Town meeting chose to bow to the will of the electorate. I guess the assessors mm -hmm. could also choose not to add that to the Yeah, well, they they would not add it unless there was an there was a um, spending authorization that would force it to right. to be done. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll go with Ben. Thank you, Ben Baston on the <coughs> Road. Um, I have two questions. One, I'm still not clear on the answer to her question. If one of these three override articles do not pass town meeting floor, then what are we voting on when we go to an override? The, the override is a single question. The decision was made by the Board of Selectmen to go with a single question. So the override will authorize <laughs> the um, raising of taxes by the $700,000 and change, um, whether or not it has been authorized to spend, the taxes can uh, are available. If, for instance, um, it's the DPW one that doesn't because it's an even number, 300000 right. um, that's the only reason I'm picking no, that's it. That's fine. Um, if that doesn't pass now, the the authorization for the revenue is there, and that can be brought up in the fall to spend that three hundred thousand again at the at a special town meeting. But if the taxpayers don't vote for it on town meeting floor, how does it get in the override? If they, um, I mean, what? If, if essentially, um, if they well, they've got a seven hundred thousand dollar override. If a uh, three hundred thousand does not pass, they're only going to raise the taxes by the four hundred thousand because you don't have the spending for it. And the second question is, why are we making this so complicated? <laughs> why why don't we just do like we've always done and say, okay, here's here's your five questions and here's your override, and well, we got articles on the floor, we got two thirds votes, we got people. I mean, there's there's a few of us here who still really don't understand. I don't know how you can have an override question that's going to involve five questions and three of them don't pass town meeting floor, but they're on the override, but the money's not going to get appropriated. The people don't know what they're voting for. That's, I mean, that's why possible. Are we, why, do we do, okay, why is this so complicated? Why can't we just simplify it? The, the, decision, the decision as to how it was, would be presented to the uh, ballot was a decision that the Board of Selectmen made. I was not at the meeting, uh, so I'm not going to speak to it on it. I don't know if somebody wants to speak to it. I'll speak to it the end of it. Yeah, sure. Right. So to make it less complicated, Board of Selectmen have one ballot question, less complicated than five. To make it less complicated, we have two budgets on the town meeting floor, two. One is the level funded, the um, uh, 
the, the one is the, the regular budget that does not allow these, this extra spending, and the second one is contingent budget that allows for, for the extra spending for uh, the 204000 for the police, 204000 for the firefighters, and the 300000 for the DPW. So it's not complicated. There's one ballot question and two options at town meeting. Three total. Hold on. And then you have three questions at town meeting that apply to those two articles that go into that one override <coughs> for one question for people to vote on. No, it, no, well, you no. Well, you do. You've got if, the, look, Go ahead. If the, first of all, the budget is going to be taken up first. So the town meeting will know then and there whether the contingent budget is in place or not. And if the contingent budget is in place, the separate questions of the police, fire, or DPW are, are no longer necessary because they've been taken care of through that uh, contingency budget. What's the reason for it? Why don't you say have an override with five questions or, or all questions in one override like we always do? Yeah. I don't understand why we need alternate budgets. I just, I, well, first of all, I just gave you a, a, a very good reason to consolidate it in, into one. So uh, another reason uh, is that we are a town as a whole, we are a community. We are not, the Board of Selectmen have the choice to bring up multiple questions at the ballot box for the voters, or one simple question. So we are a community as a whole. Do we pit DPW versus fire versus police versus this versus that versus everyone? Or do we have stand up as one, one town, one community, one vote? That was what we thought of, and that's what we did. Okay. No Ken, one was Ken, questioned in the I'm, one I'm, vote. I'm going to go back to um, what we did when the school had their override just a couple of years back, about three years ago. We passed a contingent budget. We did the same thing. We passed the budget, and we passed something that said it was contingent on an override. When the override went through, it was authorized. If the override did not go through, they would have gone back to the initial budget. That's exactly what we're doing here. It's just it's five lines instead of one. It's the same thing in terms of that, that function. I think the public needs to be perfectly clear on this, and please correct me if I'm wrong. We go to town meeting, and all three articles are passed. Mm -hmm. It goes to the override vote, the override goes through, the money is there, everything's done. Yes. If all three are defeated, we still go to an override vote. Yes. And if everybody at town meeting, the rest of town says, I was defeated, there's no override, two people decide to vote for the override, then we just added a million dollars, whatever it is, to the budget, whether it be this year or next year, the levy no. lim the limit is no. there to spend. Uh, no. uh, okay. Okay. It's there to spend. Give it to Libby. Uh, it, it may not I, have to be appropriate, the levy I, limit, I, it's there for us. I, I would want one of the assessors to speak to that because that, <laughs> that gets into the legality of that. <laughs> they need this. I don't need that. <laughs> they, they can hear you. It's oh, right there. Okay. Yes, as I was before, I'm still living there, so, but I'm also a member of the Board of Assessors. Now, a lot of misunderstanding here, and I'm going to try to make it simple. <laughs> the override. It's permanent. It's forever. It's added to the levy. Monies that it may be earmarked for this year are not necessarily earmarked for that purpose next year. So, case in point, how much was it? Seven hundred and what? Four. Seven hundred four. Seven hundred four thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay. So if that passes at the ballot box, you take last year's levy and you add an additional seven hundred four thousand dollars to the levy, in addition to things like new growth and stuff like that. But that I don't want to confuse you. But that means the town is allowed from this day forward to increase, not increase it every year, but it's attached to the levy, and that levy goes forward till next year. Now, if the articles that are the three items that you're talking about on the warrant, let's say two of them pass and one doesn't, and the two of them equal $500,000, you have 
an excess levy capacity of an extra $204,000. Now, what happens to that? <coughs> the assessors go to the selectmen, the classification hearing, to determine the tax rate. And whenever we do, we want to keep the excess levy capacity as tight as possible. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's left on the table. Okay? So what towns typically will do if there is an excess levy capacity of a large amount of money, um, they go to the town accountant and say, okay, this is way too much money. You have to put it in your estimated receipts and try to cover that so you don't lose the money. You can use it for something else, but if you pass a $704,000 override, it's only good for the expenditures you have mentioned for the first year. After that, it can be spent for whatever in the budget <coughs> they deem necessary. And if you only pass, if you pass none of the articles of town meeting, but the override, why this would happen, I don't know, but <laughs> the override, uh, you know, hypothetically still passed at the ballot box, that whole $704,000 becomes excess levy capacity, gets tacked onto the tax rate, and it does, it's there forever. So, and if anybody has any questions, I think Mike could back me up on this. that grows at 2.5% each year. Correct? Yes. yes. Okay. That's, that's not two and a half percent. It, let's say if the levy year. if the levy was ten million dollars last year, nice round number, you can add an extra two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to that. So now your new levy is ten million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Then you would add on the seven hundred and four thousand dollars that gets added in, and then the town generates new growth from construction and that gets added in. That's presumably offset by the taxes that you collect on the new properties, you know, the new structures and so forth. But it, it's important for people to understand, and I know this year it's for police and fire and so forth. That only has to be spent this year on those items. After this, all bets are off. But the $704,000 is there for us. I, I, I want to just add to that. Um, in terms of the one-year spending, Libby's perfectly correct there, uh, and uh, obviously we went through this with the schools, and um, I know the present people here, uh, the town administrator, town accountant, advisory committee, and I believe the board of selectmen. Um, you know, if the if the town is voting for it, uh, we will keep it in their budgets, uh, but as uh, Steve Dodge mentioned earlier, uh, budgets are amendable at any time on the town floor. The town meeting has the ultimate spending authority uh, for anything here. They do not have to listen to us. They can spend it, they can make an amendment and spend it somewhere else. But they can do that now. They, they can sit there and say, um, you know, I don't like how much you're spending here, I want to take it and put it over here. They, that is always uh, uh, something that can be done now. It's, uh, uh, see, just for clarification, um, I, I think something's getting confused here, and Libby, I'm going to um, maybe look to you because I think I disagree with something that, that you said, unless I heard it incorrectly. <coughs> you disagree? <Yeah>. My, understanding, <laughs> my understanding is if it doesn't pass at town meeting, it does not go to the ballot. Mm -hmm. It's but what portion? If if it's on the ballot, but but it's got to it's got to pass at town meeting to, to be able to go to the vote. Right. Is right. is there anybody that has that? Was no, your short was the ballot. On the ballot? I know it's on the ballot, but yeah. what if it fails mm -hmm. at town meeting? Yeah. If if all if all of it fails, oh, yeah. If well, all of it fails, yeah. then the, then the, the override is a moot point. Well, so correct. Well, yeah, well, but that's three. that's all three. But if one of them passes, it would be authorized by it. 
the one would, would be authorized. So, but so you that see, four thousand dollars is the amount of the override, but regardless of what they spend it on. So that's going to be added to the levy. Not, right? not, so, yes. not unless yes. we we vote for spending, because you won't add it to the levy unless it's spent. Correct, Mike? No, if the DPW article doesn't pass of three hundred thousand, what's the ballot going to be? Just the police and the fire. Seven hundred eight ballots printed. Yeah, yeah. It's it's got a figure. It's got a defined figure in the ballot. I I just think this whole argument is sort of silly. Um, <laughs> this whole discussion, not the whole discussion. Sorry, the last five minutes is sort of silly. <laughs> if this doesn't pass town meeting, if three or four hundred people go to town meeting um, and vote this. Down, it's not going to pass. It's not going to pass. Yeah. I don't even know why we're having this conversation. May I have something here? Mm -hmm. Higher staff, town bylaw says that you have to bring it up to the town meeting and get new staff approved. Mm -hmm. And while technically the two police officers that I'm looking for aren't new staff because we have that same staff in them back in 2000, this is the procedure that we have to do. So whether or not it gets funded, in order for us to get new <coughs> staff at some point, we have to have the town approve the staff level. And then you go for funding. It's a two-part thing. Yes. So those articles have to stay in for at least the fire and the police about the staff. That has to be. Okay, so whether or not it gets funded, mm -hmm. you still need information to do that. Correct. And, and again, on your thing with the police department and everything else, back in uh, the Bill Clinton era, we got three police officers on a grant. Mm -hmm. and, and the federal government pays 75%. And that's what we use to increase our staffing to meet the needs of the community. We used mm -hmm. to get community increasing grants, we had DARE grants, all the DARE programs, it's all paid for mm -hmm. outside of the town's budget. All of that's gone. And then we yeah. had three, we lost three offices and layoffs back. In 2003, yeah. 2003. And you haven't so, got them all back. Um, I think you got a couple, but. Stepping us up. We still haven't got to that level when we're caught up with today. We're still, you know, a decade behind in what our population, what our services, as far as what our funding is. But I just wanted to make that clear. While it shows some positive movement from the town, we lost a lot of funding that didn't come from the town. And now we're required to pay for about 100% of our police and the only grants that we see together for 50% of the bulletproof vest um, reimbursements. There's not a lot out there that's coming in to help pay for us. So the town has stepped up and they're paying more, and we're getting to that point. That's what the override is for. Say the word override because that's what it is. <laughs> It's an increase in funding. Why? Because the, the, the budget as is isn't meeting the needs of what the town requires. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I think, you know, I, I think what the chief said is really important for everyone in this room, everybody that's watching, and more importantly, the people that you talk to to understand it. I, I've been saying this for probably 10 years, and it's, I guess, my annual time to say it again. This is my 13th town budget. This is the 13th time, with the exception of the $1.3 million override that this town passed um, on behalf of the schools, that we are balancing the budget by cuts. I don't know a business out there that can go 13 straight years and make a balanced budget on cuts alone without generating additional revenue. The reality is our state aid increases at somewhere around a percentage to maybe 1.2, 1.3% a year. Now, in some good years, our expenses are at about one and a half, two percent 2%. In other years, whether it be the cost of petroleum, whether it be the cost of electricity, whether it just simply be the cost of retirement or benefits or healthcare, name something goes up by a lot more than one to one and a half percent. So you are basically in a situation where we have 12 to 13 years of reductions that have been made over and over and over again to balance this budget. And a deficit that is accumulates every single year. And we're all terrified to say the word override. But when trash doesn't get picked up, the phones run like crazy. God forbid if there's an accident, these two are flying with men all over this town to make sure people are safe. You know, you, 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 immediately, as soon as something goes wrong in the school, my phone rings, and I'm fine with that. But there's a cost to doing this. And the reality is where these guys have killed themselves to put together what, in essence, is a balanced budget, it is a balanced budget in name only. 
Because the reality is, we probably need even more than the $63 million just to sustain ourselves. This is a one year, maybe a two year fix. We're talking about bringing the police back to staffing levels of 14 years ago. If you pick up a newspaper, if you watch the news, you know full well these guys are required to do a heck of a lot more today than they were 14 years ago. And I just, before we start going back and forth and they're picking the deck the way the war is looking, and it, it's fair to do, it's a fair question, but the reality is th this additional budget that these guys are presenting are the override articles. So I think they're making it very clear this is what we would use the override for. So I just, I, I want everyone to think about that when they walk around town over the next couple of weeks and they try to explain this. This town, these guys, have been fighting for this for years and they haven't been able to do it. So I just want you to think about that, that's all. Steve? Had a lot of talk about the override. Everybody's interested mm -hmm. in it. Some are for it, some are not mm -hmm. sure, some are against it. I think it's very important for the public to hear. If this override passes, how much is it going to cost the average taxpayer? It's the exact number is a hundred and twenty-five, hundred thirty-five dollars a year. About, about $125 a year for a 300 house. $375,000 assessed house. Okay. I, 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 I do want to point out that it's it, the assessed value is usually less than if you put it out for sale. If somebody's saying my house is worth 500000 they have to look at what the tax bill is to really see what the effect is. Right. That 500. If I put my house on out for sale for 400,000, it may only be assessed right now for 325. It, especially if it hadn't been done in a few years, because only every three years. Um, every year. Yeah, yeah it's that's every year uh, now. Why I why I bring mm -hmm. this up? Yeah. Everything has got a cost to it. Now this board is supporting the override, and I'm not going to go into why. I think we all have heard from the prior police and the DPW. But I think it's important for the people that we're asking to vote for this to know how much it's going to cost you. To, to my way of thinking, if my house is an average house, as was just said, and I have to pay $125 a year, I'm going to pay it. It's important. We need to support these three groups here that are doing so much for the town. And... Uh, that's the way I feel about it. Steve, to, Steve, if I may. So as your, pre, as your presentation, went, I just want to get back to your presentation uh, for a moment. Uh, as you read off these, these facts and figures and the, and the comparisons from 20 other towns. Yeah, it was 24 towns total. 24 towns. 23 others, yeah. Uh, in, in general, Pembroke has been in the median. The median of yes. spending, uh, the median in... Uh, in wages, mm -hmm. the median in departmental spending. In well, I, I didn't get into wages. Okay. Okay, just in spending. Oh, departmental spending, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. 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 So, so we've been in, in the median in, in our comparable towns. Yes. Uh, so, in your opinion and the advisory committee's uh, opinion, uh, trying to be uh, in the middle, yet we are in a, a budget crunch. Uh, where does that come from in, as you see it? Um, well, I, it's as we were talking, I flipped back to the uh, chart here that shows the benefits and insurance. Um, in the last 10 years, it went from 7 million eight to 13 million 561. I mean, we've had a 72 percent increase in the benefits and insurance at a time that our revenues are going up at uh, about three percent a year. Um, or even less uh, so um, it's when you have something that is uh, starting to chew up more and more of the budget it is it is squeezing everywhere else and and that's something we've been talking about uh, I know back in 2004 2005 I was I, I first started talking about how this was going to become uh, hard and it was around that time uh, we started looking at the various things I, and that that's going back uh, 
you know, it was right after that 2003 uh, state aid cut that we really started looking at some of these things. It hasn't changed, and we haven't found a solution. Um, whether the solution is to go to the uh, the state GIC or a GIC look-alike might be better. I don't know. I don't know if it would save us any money, what, what it would do. I haven't got those figures. Well, I will say that GIC um, is, was a very big pushback uh, uh, from, from the workers in town, mm -hmm. and the Board of Selectmen sat down, well, might have been seven years ago now. It's, uh, it was a while, yeah. Yeah, so, so we, worked, we, we worked out with the unions uh, and a, a negotiated way to, to save mm -hmm. on the health care without going into the GIC. So the town got a little bit back, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the employees got a peace of mind not going into the, the GIC. The, the problem is, is that um, with the continued increase, uh, with the increase uh, this year it was what? Uh, 4.9. 4.9. 5, yeah, I was thinking 5%. Uh, four point nine percent increase at a time that our revenue is going up by uh, about three percent it's still it, it's still uh, something that um, you know it's it's I believe the GIC this year didn't go up so it's still something that um, it it has to be brought on the table if it will save us money I I don't know because I haven't done any comparisons I hear it's a little, it, it would, but uh, I, I have no idea how much, if any. Uh, but it's it's something that, I mean, it's going to be a couple of years. You, you're early into the uh, contracts right now. Um, so it's going to be a couple of years before you uh, get into the negotiations, but it's it's going to have to be raised. That that benefits and insurance is something that's going to, it's eventually it's going to uh, cause layoffs because you, you, you just can't. Like, like not a question, but I just wanted to uh, continue on what Steve was saying. If you could go back to this third slide. Sorry. The this revenue? Th yep. And you can see what state aid has done or hasn't done. Well, the lottery aid is still $354,000 less than what it was 10 years ago. Right. So the state's still taking our income tax money. The state's still taking our sales tax money. The fact remains, though, in the last 10 years, the state has chosen to, to um, increase spending in other places than municipal aid. Um, I just mm -hmm. don't want people to leave the room tonight thinking that something's wrong in, in Pembroke, because it really isn't. There's external forces pushing us, principally the state aid. If that number on the far right were 50.17% instead of 5.17%, mm -hmm. just like the Pembroke residents have been contributing, uh, I don't think we'd be having this conversation right now. No, we'd have, we'd have uh, you know, the, we'd, we'd have the firefighters <laughs> and, the, and the police officers <laughs> and a balanced budget. Yeah. I went upstairs and read the uh, ballot question because I want to be clear. It does tie it to the spe three specific requests. So it says, shall the town increase the by override the levy limit for police, fire, DPW uh, with the dollar amount? Uh, starting with the fiscal year, so and so. So I would assume then, if it does not pass town meeting, it can't be spent. It, the override would be null and void. I would think. But, but, but how do you? You've well, got three articles. Well, well, that's a whole different. So let me let me, let me let me finish. Let me let me let me finish. Let me finish, please. Yes. But it still goes to the fact of, and I've spoken for the need for police and fire. I've spoken for the years. There is definitely a need. DPW. We look at their numbers that they're underfunded compared to other towns does not mean that that money will be there the following year for police, fire, and roads. We have an inherent problem still financially. It's the elephant in the room. Across the country, the pensions of the municipal employees across the country, in this week's Saturday's Barron Magazine, $1.7 trillion underfunded. $1.7 trillion. We have 50 some odd million. And we're, they, they're making certain assumptions on rate of return. If that rate of return dropped a certain percent, it's going to get worse. So the rate of return that they're yes. estimating, uh, I, I think that like eight out of the last ten years they did not meet. Uh, I believe that every time they they go back and and revise how much behind we are in the pensions, it goes up because they're not making their rate of return. Uh, yes. I have a question. Just I I don't. 
10 years ago when there was a question about public insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't the town, and it's been done in other companies, say, okay, from now on, no employees are going to pay this money mm -hmm. and go out that way? Well, because that, <laughs> that would be something I don't think that the employees that are here no. now need would fight against. That, that was that ever? That, that, is, that, that is something that um, in various times the advisory committee has um, asked the Board of Selectmen to uh, think of that in their next negotiations uh, in terms of whether it was or what happened with it within the negotiations. Um, there's something. Well, you know, in 10 years, we've but had a lot it's, of employees but it, in the Right, but it, it's, it's, of course, it's for mo almost all of the employees in town are covered <coughs> under a union, so it would have to be in the union contract. That would have to be a negotiated item as to um, what happened there. I, you know, I'm and I think we have negotiated that over the last uh, you, three years, in the last three year contracts, we've brought everybody from the town up to Up 25%. to the 25 up to the 25 percent right. where mm -hmm. a lot of them were way down below yeah, that. Yeah, somewhere so like 18, I think. So we understand that and we have tried to negotiate that um, and got everybody up to to the 25 for now anyway. So, and that's well, something that you have Ten to years ago, the people were only paying 10 percent. And a lot of them, a lot of the unions, yeah. Right. So it, it's a process, um, you know, and it's, it is something that we, we do discuss. Uh, in a lot of the joint meetings, we, we we constantly bring it up, um, and as they said, over a period of time, they brought up the the thing as to whether they can go in because it's it's obvious a little little easier to get something that doesn't uh, hurt anyone that's currently working. Right. It's the new employees. It's a little easier to get a union maybe to agree to that, but that's but they that's know when they get the job, yeah, get right. But uh, I, again. Um, you know the unions are there to represent the people, and the and the uh, the that are within the union, the uh, selectmen are trying to represent the town, and it is a negotiation. Um, you know, it's uh, it is one of the areas that um, I think that if if you really look at the the most arguments we have is <laughs> in the union contracts. It's it's one of the areas that um, we've been most critical on over the years and, and if you go back several years there were several of the contracts that we we asked to vote no on and it, and it still went through but you know we've we've had that uh, conflict um, you know from our point of view we're thinking that you've, you've got to be uh, more stringent on it and harder on it and negotiate harder and better for the town uh, obviously we don't see everything that goes on in there but um, that has been uh, singularly the biggest argument that that our board has had with the Board of Selectmen. If I could just add that mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak to uh, negotiations that are happening behind closed doors, but I'll leave you with this. Um, every negotiation that I've been on as a member of the Board of Selectmen, both sides have been mad at me. The advisory side has been mad for what <laughs> I gave away, and the union side has mad what I took away, but didn't give them. So and The other thing is that we've taken uh, a couple of them to state arbitration, mm -hmm. and arbitration is found in favor of the union, not, yeah. not in favor of the town. So that's, that's, that's something that we can't fight that. So. Yes, Libby. Just uh, one other petition to that. As a form of a suggestion, and again, this would be for new employees to be negotiating their contracts. Um, Pembroke has uh, an anachronism. Nobody does it anymore. but. Employees that retire can walk out the door with huge compensation checks for unused sick time and comp time, and they walk out the door sometimes thirty, forty thousand dollars over and above. Nobody does that anymore. Marshfield did away with that twenty-five years ago, and new employees. You don't you don't penalize the existing employees, <coughs> otherwise you'd get clubbed. But new employees aren't going to expect that because nobody does it anymore. And believe me, there have been abuses. Not, I don't mean in Pembroke necessarily, oh. but it's there's 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 been things that have been in the paper about people retiring and and 
getting more more money in in their final check than they earned the last year and a half. That's we've my seen that in the paper. In my job, walked out the door with a check for forty six thousand dollars. That was not in Pembroke. No. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Well, um, we. I do have one more question. Oh, okay. Um, just a few questions on that. I want to know you said that if the override goes through, it's going to be how much for $375,000? $125,000. $125,000. But we're Good. also going to be paying more because of the year. It's it, it's a, it's the it, it can increase it adds to the levy so it will add to what can be increased two and a half percent a year forever yes so so we're talking a lot more than than over time yes it, it will increase over time uh, no I mean next year we're going to have that plus two plus the two and a half right it it'd be a, another fifteen thousand so that two and a half percent would add. Another, um, uh, to be about four, four, four and a half percent, seventeen and a half percent. Simple math. Oh, but I, I, she's she's talking that once it's in there, that four percent, then the next year that hundred and twenty-five is going to be another two and a half percent, which is another three dollars a house. Another three dollars on yeah. Top. Yes. I think people need to understand that if they pass a seven hundred and four thousand dollar override. Mm -hmm. It gets added to what the levy is this year. And that stays with the levy. Right. But don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean next year you add another 704000 No, it's 2.5%. Two and a half percent. So that $125 for that house will add another, uh, say, 350 the next year, 2.5% of the 125 That's what you were getting at? That, that, yes, that house will continue to go up. How much they're going to have to pay in taxes yeah. if so it, 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 it becomes personal, you know, what's, what is it to me, uh, and, and in that case they get the 125 added and then the next year it's going to be, it'll be a part of the overall increase but it'll be averaging say about 350 a year for, you know, and you know, in 100 years obviously it grows, but I mean it's, it, it does add to the 2.5% that you can increase it. Yes, Steve. Uh, just a quick, looking down the line, the increase we do a prop two and a half override the increase. We, we just went through from the professor last week saying that we're going to have well over a million dollar deficit next year. So if that happens, are we hiring people to lay them on? Um well again if, if you if you look at some of the things that he included in there, um I'm just gonna go through some of this stuff as I um you know for instance, uh, he added 240000 for capital outlays that we didn't have this year. Then uh, he increased uh, uh, he increased how much we were putting into the stabilization by 50000 the OPEB 100000 that workers' comp fund that we started, $25,000. Uh, so, you know, there's... There's hundreds of thousands of dollars that he added into that figure that are completely discretionary. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, will it eventually in two or three years? Um, again, you you go back to what's happening in state aid, what's happening in some of the things, if our, if our income is going up about 3% a year and our uh, benefits are going up by 7 and we continue to have other things going up by, you know, 4 or 5%, eventually, you know, in a couple years, you run right back into that situation and you may have a layoff in two, three, four years because the other things are... Uh, pushing the expenses up, but the revenues aren't there. We've gone to the well on the revenues in terms of some of this stuff. Um, you know, we, we added about, uh, oh, it's, uh, we added the um, stuff for the um, 
tax that the in lieu of tax solar 105,000 the rental solar 76,000 were added in and a few years ago we added the meals tax was a 328,000 um, also within all of the solar thing is a reduction in some of the expenses we had you know through smoke and mirrors we've we've gotten all of this I have no idea where we're going to come up with something like that which will give us a you know a 200,000 you know well, one hundred and eighty one thousand dollar boost in revenue and a what was our projected savings on the solar this year it'll uh, be 250 eventually uh, it'll be 250,000 eventually um, but 67 percent go to the schools yeah but well I mean and some of it goes to the water department as well correct and right. um, you know because it's uh, which is an enterprise fund so um, <coughs> You know, uh, if something else comes up, if we can add another solar field or something, I don't know. But, um, you know, I don't know where we're going to come up with stuff like that. And that's what's kept us from collapsing right now. Uh, coming up with uh, the meals tax and the solar fields. Uh, I, you know, I don't, you know, I just don't know where, where the next one like that will come because it, it will, uh, and, and it could, you know, it, again, it comes in state aid. Um, I think that uh, there's a ballot question that's coming up to lower the sales tax down to five percent. Um, you know, if the state loses that kind of money, I'm sure that it's going to going to come from us somewhere <laughs> in the state aid to the cities and towns. Uh, and again, uh, you know, it's um, when you look at the state aid figures, and um, I got that. No, that was earlier on. Um, you know, it's. I I like to say that the state aid is. Um, it's it's an aid to cities, and if there's any left over, it goes to towns. Uh, Brockton is getting two thousand dollars per capita, uh, in state aid. Uh, Pembroke's getting eight hundred and thirty-four. Um, you know, it's. <laughs> it, it is what it is. Brockton has uh, what 14 reps, sta 12 state reps, uh, and we share a state rep with Hanson and um, uh, Duxbury. You know, so <laughs> you know we're not heard, and it's and it's a uh, simple matter of numbers there. You know, Quincy, Lowell, uh, you know, all of these cities basically <coughs> make sure that the state aid figures favor them. And that's where all the state reps are, and we get the, the leftovers. Sure, Don. Yeah, uh, Don Bryan up on the Mount Now. Um, the question for you, uh, the savings that a town should have, mm -hmm. that, is there some kind of guide for we're, we're in trouble because we have only this amount or only that amount? Um, I think that the, the suggested rate is 3% uh, of your budget should should be free cash every year. And I think that we've topped out at about 2, 2.5 and in that range. I, f I forget what it is. Uh, but we're, we're well below that. And um, again, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to say what it's going to come in, but um, we used $784,000 of uh, uh, local receipts we increased our estimates there um, so that's going to significantly cut into what's available in free cash uh, so we're well below the recommended figures uh, one other thing I want to say um, this this last year a couple of years have been quite involved politically and retired some things next to come there and I've done a lot of uh, house to house kind of stuff you know if you do in politics and I can't tell you the number of senior citizens I've come across in tears at their doorstep about our property tax. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, the amount of work being put into this is immense and the needs are, are phenomenal. I understand that. And I'm not sure actually how to take that into account. Uh, our, our seniors, some of our seniors are scared. And I've also been involved in fuel assistance work in terms of raising funds um, and had the experience of those 
conversations, you know, at the table, we're raising money, we're seniors, shuffle over to the table and, and tell us their stories. Now, th there's other ways to help I know that I'm not aware of. Uh, so, you know, you guys are much more aware of that than I am. But I, I just want to put a note here that I'm sure is part of the selectmen's planning is um, the fear of some of our seniors that we're going to go the old way, which is they're going to get pushed, and you know as we as we move the taxes up. I'm sure it's already been taken account of, but to me, being pretty new, that's a pretty stunning experience. That I've had over the last uh, couple of years. Could I add something to what this gentleman said? Sure. Just be aware that Pembroke has been very proactive in putting in place programs to help senior citizens over the age of 65. I mean, to the point where they can defer their taxes. And they have to meet certain income and asset limitations, but uh, there are senior exemptions, there are deferrals, and we recommend uh, you know, that they come down to the assessor's office, talk to the assessor. She can explain the process to apply for this. And I've always said there's no excuse for a senior citizen to choose between paying their real estate taxes and buying their medication or their food because the town has the ability to set that aside until either they sell a the property or they pass away. Yeah, I, I went to one of those workshops uh, just just to see what was being offered, and the, the amount of poverty you have to be in to get help it's, uh, is it's pretty extraordinary. You, you, by that time, I'm surprised you can even be living. The amount you that would qualify you for the aid, but that, that's a conversation that doesn't belong it's, here. I know, yeah. but thank you for that. Uh, it's a, it's you know I I know. Peg Strozik isn't here to, to uh, speak on on that regard. I, I'm involved with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul out of Our Lady of the Lake in Halifax, and we have a food bank. And there's there's quite a few seniors that come through there that, that are in need of help. And I'm sure that the, that if Peg was here, she she'd indicate that as well. Uh, but there are there is there, there's a lot of help out there for them. Unfortunately, some of them they, they they have a lot of pride, and <laughs> they don't want to they don't want to accept that help. <laughs> yeah, it's a. And I appreciate all the towns doing. It's not a criticism. Mm -hmm. It's just an awareness that yeah. uh, when we say it's only one hundred twenty-five dollars, <laughs> that's that's serious money for some people. Yeah, it's ten do uh, ten dollars a month to somebody. That's it's a, right. And uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not sure that balance is you know. Uh, it's a or whatever, or whatever else <coughs> it should be. But you know, just human compassion says that we recognize that mm -hmm. what we maybe casually do is not so casual to other people. Steve got a suggestion that the Council on Aging is always looking for volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> drivers no. Meals on Wheels drivers. Oh, <laughs> Town of Pembroke supports the tax work off. Right. Program five hundred dollars a year right. off your taxes if you can qualify. Right. So they are looking for help. People are looking for help on their own to pay their taxes. I think it's a great deal. And I believe the income restrictions are a lot less stringent <coughs> on that that yes. particular yeah. program than some of the other programs. Yes. Um, if I I don't remember the specifics, but I remember it is a lot better. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Any other can, questions? Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. We'll move on to uh, the next item then. Thank you for uh, the participation in this. Um, the next thing up on the agenda will be the town government study committee, um, the town manager article um, <coughs> will be presented before the board. Um, talk about the present article details on the town manager article number 21 and to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, so Tim Brennan is here. 
get caught up in the flow of people who can get them. I think we're just waiting to have, I just want to bring a slide oh. up so it's easy to... I just like conversation. I know, lots of people stuck around for this one. So I just got skewered by the assessors and the planning board. I figure uh, kind of uh, talking about no cost would, would be interesting. Empty. Okay. You still with us, Matt? I <laughs> guess the phone is still on. You may be on mute. Wall game is on too. Hey, I'm here. Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Uh, that's all right. We just uh, we're through with um, with the presentation of the uh, town meeting, and we're now going to be working. Uh, on the town government study committee article number 21 and um, we're going to have a, a presentation here and um, yeah sure so thank thanks for for making some time for us again um, I'm not going to give a presentation like so this is the this is a slide from a presentation I gave uh, earlier this month um, but I, I kind of just want to take time I think especially after we just sat through a lot of discussion about things that are going to cost Pembroke uh, money in the future. I think what the town government study committee is kind of bringing to the table with our pr proposition for a town manager article is uh, a rare opportunity for a zero cost investment in the community's future. So I think um, our main goal has been to propose a way that we can logically align professional staff within the town um, and separate out policy making boards. So uh, I'm displaying here on the, on the chart uh, what our current organizational structure looks like. Um, and then underneath, we kind of have a proposed structure that we've come up with. Um, I'll say this committee has had its iterations for the past um, you know, over a decade. So I'm, I'm excited that there's some momentum and engagement around this. And I'm hoping that the townspeople will kind of support um, what I'd consider a kind of logical streamlining of, um, of staff within town. And I, you know, I'm happy to, to answer any questions um, the board or anybody else in the room has about about the, about what we're proposing. Can I just begin with one thing, uh, Tim? Of course, I'm on the committee, but I'll ask you as, as, as speaker. Uh, all the the elected boards and committees that are in town right now, uh, do they all remain? Yeah, yeah, I will I'll make that clear. So there, we're not proposing eliminating any elected or appointed boards in this act. It's simply kind of reorganizing where professional staff lie. So there'd be no changes as far as what, what exists, what does not exist. That's important because um, as, as we were studying this for the last, well, I've, I've been on the committee for, for three years, but in the last year and a half, we were really geared up uh, with this goal in mind and one of the things that we've heard from town townspeople uh, not only heard from townspeople to, that all the boards of committee elected boards of committee should, should remain but it, they serve a function that's uh, both uh, statutory there's state laws governing each one that's the reason they were established in the first place and they also serve a function that uh, a single manager cannot do so for, for the DPW, water commissioners, the board of assessors, uh, the uh, planning board, those those folks, uh, and also the board of health, uh, those folks need to stay in place and they need to function uh, as a board that performs policy duties, that researches uh, how how their department is working, how to help their how to help their department director if they have one. Uh, but the director themselves should do, should report to a CEO, uh, a central management figure, and then that's that's the thought process that the committee has been been looking at. And I just wanted you to expand on that a little bit, if you could. 
Yeah, sure. And I think there's been some confusion related to, oh, okay, so Ben's here. So I think there's been some confusion related specifically to the, the DPW. Um, and admittedly, I think the language in the in the article is a bit confusing around DPW and maybe, can, maybe Ed or Dan could explain it a little bit better. My understanding is that there's language in the article that rescinds the DPW as is. Um, and I think that's due to kind of state law that's established and how that department was what was um, was brought into the town. Um, but we've also included language that recreates the commissioners because our intent is never to, um, um, particularly with kind of like setting the water rates and water revenue. I know I know those things have kind of come up as as points of discussion. Um, our intent is that still remains with the DPW commissioners. We, they'll be setting the water rates. They'll be responsible for the enterprise fund. Um, the, on, the only thing that really changes is where the, the director lies within the organizational structure, and that would change from under the DPW commissioners, it would move under the, the post town manager. So um, I don't know if. I, uh, I have a question. Sure. Why is that so important? If you're, if, you're, if you're only looking to move the director from the DPW to under the town manager, I don't see any reason or any problems that have occurred in the past or any reason to even do that. And in doing that, we have to abolish the whole act of the DPW and then recreate the DPW. And there isn't any specific language in the article that says that the commissioners will remain in charge of the water department or the enterprise fund or the water setting rates. But it does specifically say that you're abolishing the DPW and you're taking the director and putting them under the town manager should the article pass. So I, I don't see the need for all of that. I don't, I don't even see the need to touch the DPW at that point. If you're going to leave it alone, then why are you moving the director? He's been functioning like this for years, and, and, he, and he works very well in the environment. There's been no problems, no issues. There's no need to touch it. So, that, so two pieces to that question. One, again, I think our, our main goal is to align professional staff under professional management within the town. Um, so even if, even if nothing has gone wrong in the past, I'm trying to... I think we're trying to be kind of proactive in looking forward and what logically makes sense. Um, so I think logically it would make sense to have, again, professional staff within the town reporting to professional management rather than um, volunteer or appointed board members. Um, and then as far as the, the language in the act around um, who controls the enterprise fund, um, I think that's something we are looking into because if if there's not a state statute that specifically says that DPW is also or always responsible for that, we do want to make clear and are willing to amend that so that that language is in there. Because that's how we want it to be. The state legislative article that created the DPW put the water and, and it went through a specific group of things that belong under the DPW. And if you're going to abolish the act and you want to leave the directors in charge of the water, you've got to amend the article to come up with language to say that. Because the article specifically says it abolishes the act that created the DPW. And at that point, there is no DPW legislatively. It's only whatever the town makes it. So if you're going to make it something, then you've got to amend the language to make it something because the language is not there. Yeah. So and we once you abolish the DPW, your town manager is in charge of it all. But please, please, with the there's a connotation to that, abolish the DPW. We're not abolishing the DPW. We're abolishing the act that formed the DPW in 1991 because That's that correct. because that act was, as you know, had a large mm -hmm. umbrella that that we need to abolish the act and reestablish the DPW. But and that's what, that's what this article does. But you don't go far enough in there because you don't reestablish the water department. I, I agree. We need to amend that so it's clear as the day. The language has to be clear in there. Yeah. Well, I we, think we reached out to town council. So you know, that, that's our intent. We want to leave that in there. So whether, <laughs> it, whether it's implied by just having a DPW or there's some legalese that has to change to, um, 
to make that apparent. That's what we're trying to do. I would tell you that the legalese needs to be in there and the implication needs to be very clearly defined because we have a tendency around here to imply things and then things change down the road. So if you're going to leave the water department alone and you're going to leave your water commissioners in charge of the enterprise fund and the water rates, the language needs to be in there because you clearly create a DPW of some sort after you abolish it. So you clearly need to finish the language. And if I could just go on, why? This committee yeah. wants why? The, why the DPW, why we want the DPW to continue continue on in, in, in their function. Uh, Tim's already spoke about the man managers, the director speaking to a manager. But I'll speak about the, the function of the DPW and the water commissioners. Uh, the water commissioners need to, to meet, need to be able to meet separately. There's something a town manager can't do on his own. He would have to sub it out. So we need we need volunteers. We need elected people to come in to set the water rates. And not only set the water rates. The water rates are set for what? Water rates are set to what the water costs are, what the cleaning of of the of the water is. Uh, the new roadway work that you need, the new pipes, the new wells, all the research, the engineering. So exactly. we, we need, so just so there's no, even though the language is fuzzy and I agree with you, that's the way it's written, we need to amend it. But the committee is, it understands that the DBW needs to act as the water commissioners now and going forward. Water is going to be one of the biggest resource battles in the future. And we already have a plan at our DPW to protect this town's resources and to develop further resources. And if that thing gets sidetracked at this point in time, future, we could be in trouble for water resources. There's a battle going on out there for water that, that is, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable when you get involved in it. I, only because I'm involved in it I can say that, but when I realize the magnitude of what's going on for water grabs, and you know that the issues we have with, with Brockton and other towns pumping and, and, the, and the resources we, we as a community in the past gave up, we, we've got a lot of area we need to cover and protect. And, and the language needs to be clear in there so that that can continue and the town can be protected. We so, agree. Right, we agree. And it's just an issue of, you know, we can't write it so we're deferring to town council to make sure it gets done correctly. Will, will they be able to get it in the warrants printed? Yeah, the warrants printed, but it, as, you, as you know, when, when we go to town meeting, there's usually a tweak or two, and, and some articles are within spirit, but written according to uh, the way the law wants it to. So it's not an amendment. You're reading it rather than saying as printed. You're reading your motion from what town, town council gives you. So one thing we do want to check, though, Ben, even though, even though the establishment of the DPW as written uh, was slim at best, um, we want to make sure that he, he looked at that. and He the, meaning town council. He so. meaning town council. Because there may be... Uh, state law that overrides that already establishes that the, the DPW and, and the Water Commission act whatever one. it may be it's just it's got to be clear that, that the Water Department is established and protected and and so forth the way we're discussing it here we agree so we have your support <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't have. I, again, I'm I'm here to kind of answer questions. I, I think it's a I think it's a rare opportunity. And it's, again, since given a lot of what we're talking about at all of the budgetary <coughs> meetings and every town meeting is something that costs the town money, um, this ultimately doesn't cost anything. And I think, especially over the long term, it kind of streamlining operations like this um, results in some big benefits. Tim, yep. can I just go back to the DPW again? Sure. What we're talking about is Section 7, Department of Public Works. There's three paragraphs, A, B, and C. Now, we're going to amend with council's approval that, we, that section. We're go if needed. We just want council to ensure that the DPW, as reestablished by this act, is still going to remain in control of setting the water rates and the enterprise fund. So they might say that, hey, 
state law says that anything called the DPW always has to be in control of the enterprise fund, then we don't have to change anything. But we just, we're just waiting for them to come back and tell us. Yeah, well, I don't clear. see anything in here about water department. Right, which is, a, which is our question to town council, because they might right. have looked at it and say, hey, it's, it's implied that the DPW is always controlling that, so that's why we didn't address it. But yeah. we just, I think we reached out today just to make sure, because we right. want to make it okay. clear. Or, or town council may not have known that that was the intent, was to leave right. the enterprise yes, fund. That's why and I don't know the, you know, and yeah. I don't know what Joel Bard um, had in mind, because I didn't, he didn't get it, he didn't call back, you know, and I called him right after I talked to Dan, and uh, he was out the whole day, and I waited until town, you know, until tonight's meeting. Yeah, let's have a conversation with him and make, make sure uh, that the language uh, the language is, is clear to the intent. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to explain to him exactly what the conversation that we're having here tonight is, and does that Section 7 reflect what we want to do? If not, what can we do to change it so that it would, it would reflect the conversation that we're having? Right, and, and when we say... Uh, the, the water budget, the, the water commissioners set the rates and, and, and have a charge of the enterprise fund. Uh, when it's important for them to, to be able to manipulate the funds such that they could facilitate the cleaning, uh, the, the constant well, I mean, the, the cost of maintenance in the future. water commissioners, they're in charge of the enterprise fund and they got total control and, over that fund. And, and, and the importance there is only only for what Dan is driving at, the, the, the global aspect sure. of running the water division, not only the cleaning and the wells, but the upkeep and, and, and the future resources and, and the wells that we're planning and, and the water towers and, and everything associated with it. We're, we're replacing, when we're doing these road projects, we're replacing old water mains right. and we're replacing old house connections and we're putting them on on the larger mains so that they've got better pressure, they've got cleaner water, so when we flush our systems, they're not getting brown water, but we're getting it flushed out and, and we're getting the tests that we need. And it's all of that sort of thing. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's, it's not that we want to control the money and do it. it. It's a function of being able to put the needs where they come as we go and still have a little money in case we have a water main break or in case we have a fire or in case a hydrant goes or when something else happens. It's all there, it's self-sufficient. We don't have to come to the taxpayers and therefore we try to keep the rates down because we're able, we're at a point where we're really self-sufficient and efficient with it. I think Tim and Dan have made it very clear so that their they're, intentions they're are- Working in the right direction. That they are, that's right. And you know, your question of the, the um, DPW director, I mean, if you're gonna have a department head meeting in town hall, you need to have seven or eight or nine departments, whatever there are, and you have to include in that the, uh, the DPW uh, director. So that's, that, that's that, you know, that it doesn't that's an seem incidental issue in terms of the water department. Right, and I can see keeping the water department, first of all, I don't know who would want the position of resetting the water rates because they never go down. No, so. but, but, but they're pretty stable right now. And, right and, now. And, and we've got some debt service coming off and things are, Things are working in a in a positive fashion that that nothing has to change. Are we working on a strategy for Abington Rockland, for example? We are. For, we are. For them pulling, you know, they're pulling Great Sandy we're, down to. We're, we're we're all over that issue. We're all over the Brockton issue with with pulling down Silver Lake because that affects that affects Sandy as well. Even though it's not a direct effect, it affects it affects the the water levels, and then they draw down. And we have to shut wells down when they get to a certain point. What we're working on now is having them be restricted when they get to a certain point so we don't have to shut our wells down. Right, and I can see the, uh, the need for having DPW commissioners in place because there are going to be times where we're going to look for land, for example, to protect our wells. And exactly. when we do that, we're going to be able to do it through the enterprise fund in most cases and not have to... Uh, you know, go through a big, you know, dog right. and pony show. Right, and that's what we did. We did at the old Chip Tech site up there in the, in the back, um, Swanberg property. Right. When we bought that, we're we're in the process of putting new wells in up there. 
on so that we can service the north side of town and get that water tank up on the north side to be full all the time so when this industry comes in we're not going to have a problem up there with water pressure because we'll have wells that can handle that and we're not pumping it from the other side of town you know that the um, Abington Rockland also has a bill um, into DEP and uh, I'm not sure about legislation but also into DEP about drawing water putting another pipe into Furnace Pond and drawing water um, cleaning it up and sending it and selling it to Brockton. We're, we're in the process of, um, of uh, what do you call it, uh, fighting that. Yeah. That's yeah, no, 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 no. It's, you know, it's one thing to draw on it. It's another thing to sell yeah. it somewhere else. Can, oh, yeah. can I just make a few Go more ahead. points and then Go I'll, I'll uh, yeah, yield no, the floor no. back to the discussion. Yeah. Um, there, there are a couple final points I just want to make on this. One, there's, there's a bit of a perception, I think, of kind of you know, I think we're fortunate in the town that we've had some boards that are very experienced um, and have been operating functionally well in a, even though it's kind of siloed off. Um, again, I try to think of this as kind of a more long-term thinking and being proactive because at some point, um, you know, we're not, we might not have these experienced boards. Um, so I think that's, that's another reason why I just re really want to focus on kind of aligning professional staff. Um, a, a, another point of note is just as we kind of talk about investing more in the community, when you go out and seeking funds and asking people to pay more taxes to invest in this, invest in the community, I think if, if you give them a picture, this, this current structure of how the, how the town government is aligned, um, they might look at that and say, well, you know, you're kind of asking me to throw money into a mixer here. Um, what, what's going on? But I, I, think if, I think the community is going to be a lot more comfortable willing to spend and willing to have their tax rates increase and willing to invest in the community if they look at kind of what we're proposing is a clean kind of operating structure in the town and they know that there are kind of clear lines of communication and there's stuff not being lost in translation. Um, so there's... I, I just have um, one thing. I said, I, <coughs> I apologize but not because um, I haven't been here for the last uh, you know month or so because I was out injured but um, they didn't, didn't really get a chance to really look over and really go through everything about this, but I do believe in a town manager system. But the one thing that I don't understand is that if we're going to go that professional into a town manager and all that, then why are we having all these other boards? I can see having um, an assessor, a chief assessor or whatever, that reports to the town manager and runs that, but I don't understand why we're keeping all of the boards and commissions and all that. Can you just explain um, what that part of it is? I mean, why are we keeping everybody else if we're trying to go more professional with the town manager running with heads of departments? Sure. I, I mean, I think different people have different thoughts, but I, I can give you my personal thoughts. One, I think it's still important to kind of have the community involved. So if you have some policy-making bodies with other parts of either appointed or elected the community, I think that's generally a good thing. Um, and two, it's if I, you know, there, I think it's a separate discussion or whether or not the roles within kind of policy or, or policy making boards are actually needed. I think it's a fair discussion to have, but I do think kind of blowing all that up and doing this realignment at the same time might be a little too much to swallow. So we're trying to just make kind of baby steps forward. Um, and then if there's a future discussion to be had, about whether or not a particular board um, or body makes sense, I think that's, you know, I think that's fair game. I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Oh, sure. And the, so the boards the, the boards that are in place now, the elected boards, uh, serve a function statutorily. The, the, the board of assessors are necessary. Uh, whether they're elected or appointed, you still have to have a board of assessors. You still have to have a planning board. So, so the, the boards have to be there. And as Tim said, you know, we, we need to take one step at a time. This, this is a big step for the town, and it's an important step and I, that I think we should take. And to... Um, to change too much at once, uh, we might we, we run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So we don't want to do that. I think too, and we brought it up in the past that you know you know we've been fortunate to have Ed for a long time, but at some point Ed's not going to be here, and we really want to put ourselves in a position to attract a top quality candidate for town manager. Um, and kind of this the current structure um, 
isn't as good of a recruiting tool as what we're proposing as a structure. I think somebody coming into a much more um, aligned organization um, that... But you know, he's, he's, you might as well call him a town manager because he's because that's what he does now anyway. Um, most all of the things that I read in here, um, it does. Sure. He's, he's uh, you know, he, he already has all these department head meetings with, with all of the heads of the boards and he al already runs a lot of the things and he gets he gets a lot of his um, input when he comes back to the five board of selectmen and says, you know, this is what I really think should be done or shouldn't be done. And, and uh, we either agree with him or disagree with him. Yeah. And the only thing I can see is that most of the stuff that's under the board of selectmen is is pretty much um, gone as far as, um, you know, any power or structure at all ends up in, onto the town manager. Yeah, so well, again... Just um, you know, professional management. We're trying to push under the town manager, so appointing yeah. powers, but policy decisions remain with the board and the, the voters. Um, you know, I think it's a, and also it's a good opportunity if, um, you know, if like I said, we've been lucky to have Ed if he's here um, to kind of usher in or help us through this transition. It's even kind of better timing for us. So, when you uh when you met with uh, these committee for the last few years or whatever, and you looked at all of these other towns around, do they all do this the same way? Is no, certainly not. Not definitely. Yes. Towns don't do it the same way. We're seeing more and more towns move towards some type of town manager structure, um, but I certainly wouldn't say that all towns are doing this, or even necessarily the same way. Um, we're trying. You know, I think we. We're taking the best of what we've seen and trying to improve upon it and make it because we believe it can work within our town. I mean, every town is kind of unique too, so I can't really speak to the histories of different towns that are doing this, but I can say that a lot of towns are moving towards this town management structure. Right, but I can see that when you look at when you look at the last time the town manager came up for a town vote, it got voted down because people didn't want that because they were going to lose all of these. Um, Boards, commissions, um, you know, and all of that, and it was going to be more under the town manager control. So, if you really believe in a town manager control, I just I don't understand why you need all of these other boards and commissions. That's well, that just that just doesn't make sense to me because if you if you look at other towns, it's it's really not it's really not that way. It's um, I think from like what, Dan from what I see of it anyway. It's, yeah. I think, like Dan said, some of it's just required by law, so you can't, right. you just can't do much about that. But um, I don't know. I mean, as as far as the other boards and commissions go, I think it's fair to discuss in the future whether or not we need them or not. Right. And so every town, every town has board of assessors, planning, <coughs> DPW, board of health. You have to. You have to by law. So whether you have a town manager or not, every town does it. Uh, whether they're elected or not, uh, in, up to each individual town, but that's inconsequential. The fact is, every town has has these boards, and these boards are there by law. Uh, planning board, subdivision control, assessors, of course, you you, you, ta you tax money, uh, and they have to be there. So the the manager the manager relationship with those boards is really the relationship of the manager to the director. Uh, uh, Kathy, the, the assessor, the board of assessors, uh, Gene, the DPW director, in the case of the DPW. That, so, uh, you know, the, the board of health, which was realigned last year. So we need the manager to, uh, to manage the directors, and the, the directors will serve the policy that's set by the boards, and the boards will also serve the set statutory functions that they do now. That's the big thing. This is not the, the town manager is not not directing the boards. So I guess that, that might be a misconception. Maybe you don't have, though, but some people might out there. The, the town manager is not directing the planning board. He's not directing the board of assessors. He is, he is the, uh, uh, direct, uh, the director of the directors, the manager of the directors. Any other questions for him? Or Dan? Good job. Great. Did, did you have a question, Arthur? I didn't hear. No, I said great job. Oh, okay. Yeah.
Thank you for coming in. Um, and I guess have a great couple other things on the agenda and um, do we uh, we don't have any old business to discuss well, we've discussed a lot of town administrators report do you have anything uh, else just a couple on? of things number one you have a summary of the route 40 53 corridor project and if you have any questions um, Sabrina did they get the full copy by email Okay. All right. So, yeah, it's 60 pages yeah. long. So yeah, I wanted no, to kind of condense that. Yeah. So, if you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, hazardous waste day Saturday. We had about 144 cars uh, were there uh, during the course of the during the day. So, again, a very successful uh, event. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to read the Suffolk University citizen survey that was sent out that was responded to by some 400 residents it's 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 really interesting reading um and it, it gives you a sense of what people think are important in the community so it's a it's a it's it's worth uh, spending a a bit of time and and going through that survey and that suffolk university yeah, Suffolk. That's the one we did as a result of the str strategic planning of retreat. And where would we find that? Pardon? Where would we find that? It was in last oh, week's packet. Oh, was on, yeah. See, I didn't yeah. get that. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't get last week's packet. So, so uh, we're behind. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, anything about else to select on? Any new business? And then um, any upcoming events, Lou, uh, a couple of things that you Yeah, I just wanted to remind, the board wants to remind the public that on May 8th, the annual town meeting be held at the high school, and we hope to start promptly at 7 p.m. Also on <coughs> Saturday, May 12th, is the annual town election. Several very important uh, races need to be voted on and we hope you'll all come out and vote. Thank you. Is there a need for executive session? No, sir. No need for executive session. Move uh, to adjourn if you're done. Our next uh, regular scheduled meeting will be uh, on May 14th, um, which actually uh, we'll probably have a meeting, I would assume, um, May 8th before the annual town meeting. Special. Um, a special meeting as well. Right. So, so it'll probably be around 6.30 because town meeting is going to start at 7. Yeah. So we'll probably meet 6.30 at the uh, school. And then the next regular schedule one here would be at uh, May 14th. Mr. Um, Chairman, uh, before you adjourn, may I uh, just say that uh, welcome back. Oh, thank you. We're well, glad to have you back and uh, hope you'll be here to stay. Uh, they, uh, they did a lot of bionic work to me, so uh, I should be in uh, good shape in a few more months and uh, ready to go. And uh, yeah, the only other thing that I can say is, is and I had mentioned it earlier, is that uh, uh, Division of Marine Fisheries uh, seems to think that we're going to supersede and bypass um, what our um, uh, highest goal was last year. Um, we're already um, hmm. well over 200,000 fish that have right. already come up, and uh, and they're just coming up like gangbusters this year. And all of the guys are working really hard uh, day by day, um, in the morning and at night, taking uh, taking readings and uh, making sure that the things are clear and everything is working properly. And we we have had a little bit of problems with uh, with the water. Um, I can only apologize to some of the residents on Furnace Pond, but we've had so much water this year that it's really hard to control. Um, and the fact being is that um, Brockton has not taken any water at all this year um, um, since the first part of the year because um, they were pretty much told um, not to take any water until they fixed the screening, um, which they authorized. Um, 
$58,000 to fix the screening so no more fish end up in, in mm -hmm. Silver Lake. So we're waiting for them to fix that. Uh, Division of Marine Fisheries has been on their tail to get that done. Um, and as soon as we get that all done, then uh, we shouldn't have a problem with losing a lot of these fish to Silver Lake. Uh, so it's um, everything is coming along really good in that end of it. So. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to take, before we adjourn a moment, to uh, uh, thank uh, Mr. Stone for his service on the Board of Selectmen. Um, this will be the last televised meeting that we will have, um, you know, with Lou. Um, so it's been a, an enjoyable nine years. Uh, Great. And uh, I, uh, I don't think we can find enjoyed anybody. his... Uh, Friendship, very much. He has been a very friendship. classy gentleman. I don't think we can find anybody that's worked this hard as well. I'm, uh, I'm really putting a lot of stuff together for us. Uh, I know it's been an enjoyable time working with you. Thank you. Nine years went by. I look back, they went by very quickly. Our gift to you is going to be a no truck sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we still have a couple of projects <laughs> in the works. Yes, we do. And uh, Ed has promised to send me a pulse gun. Yeah. It has been a pleasure serving with you, Lou. Uh, Thank you, you and I came in together. That's we right. We ran for each time together. I felt like you were my running mate and partner this whole time. So, uh, yeah, we ran. I enjoyed being with you. Three times together. And every time, I don't know why, we always ran with somebody running against us. <laughs> Never got a walk. Never got a walk in, right. But, uh, yeah, it's been good, and I certainly have enjoyed working with the board and uh, all the department heads here at Town Hall. Anything I've had to do with them, they've, they've been great. And, of course, Mrs. Chilcott. I couldn't have done, a, done anything without her. Thank you. Great job. Move to adjourn. Second. Back on. All right, you hear that, Matt? You still there, buddy? I think he may have signed off. <laughs> oh, the phone's still on. It's still on. Matt, are you still there? You're on you. Watch on the Red Sox. <laughs> Matt, are you there, buddy? Well, oh, this by roll call. <laughs> so, this still by, by roll call. Yes. 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 And I'm um, yes, and uh, we'll have to put him as uh, President not voting. President not voting. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes uh, Monday, April 30th, 2018, Board of Selectmen meeting. We've covered a lot of uh, articles and um, um, had quite a bit of discussion tonight, and uh, hope to see you at town meeting. Thank you.